All right, we're shifting gears a bit here. Our thanks to Jeremy Lofquist for coming on, TBI Assistant Special Agent in Charge, as we're talking about human uh, trafficking, sex trafficking, children involved and the like, some of the cases going on. And as you heard them say, the TBI works quite often with our kids, an organization I'm involved with. I like to volunteer my time with uh, all the great work they do. With us now to talk about more of the interaction with the TBI and how they handle these cases from the victim side is Lisa Milam. Good morning to you. How are you, Lisa? Good morning. I'm doing fine. How are you? Good. Jeremy was just on Lofquist and talked about working with uh, our kids on this uh, human trafficking, sex trafficking, and he's, you know, talks, of course, from the law enforcement end of it. And they say once they maybe find some of these victims, they'll oftentimes uh, get uh, our kids involved. And uh, that's pretty much the case, isn't it? When they come to you, uh, just let our viewers know kind of what that next step is when they end up with our kids. Yeah, we are an outpatient clinic of National General Hospital, and we provide medical care for children, or children, typically anyone under the age of 18, so 17 or under, when there are concerns of sexual abuse or sexual exploitation. Uh, certainly if there are children identified as part of a law enforcement uh, operation where they may have been victims of sexual violence of any kind, then those children will be referred to us. Uh, pretty quickly to assess for their their medical and their health care needs because uh, not only is there you know significant psychological uh, trauma that can occur for children but they have also significant health needs that also need to be addressed by specialized health care providers and that's what we do here at the our kids center at general hospital and you talked about the age did you say was it 17 and under typically 17 and under there okay. are a couple of yeah, there, there are some variations, but typically 17 and under are the, the population of kids that we see. Sure, that makes sense. And again, the, the, the shocking part is the younger it gets. And I, you may have heard, uh, we, we were talking a bit briefly just about the standard investigative procedure in cases like this one with Summer Wells, the little blonde girl, five-year-old missing out of uh, far northeast Tennessee. Um, we don't know that she was involved in any human trafficking, but that's certainly on the table since she's vanished and there's not a trace. And, and she's only five years old. It can happen that young well I mean when you talk about sexual abuse certainly again yes it can happen at very young ages in fact the majority of our population are kids under the age of 10 or 11 um, I mean there's just a reality that sexual abuse affects children of all ages and the more the, the younger a child is the more vulnerable they are uh, and the more in need of protection and, and services they are I think uh, you and uh, Sue Fort White and others emphasize the fact that if you suspect a child involved in any kind of sexual abuse, any kind of physical abuse, period, it's the law, is it not, that you report it? It is. Every person in Tennessee is a mandatory reporter when there are concerns or allegations of child sexual abuse. And those concerns or allegations must be reported to the Tennessee Department of Children's Services uh, and there's a, a, a child abuse reporting hotline number in Tennessee. Uh, and again, if any person in the state has any information um, that suggests or is, is cause for concern that a child may be a victim of any type of abuse or neglect, certainly sexual abuse, they are obligated by law to make a report to that hotline uh, at, at any time. Um, yeah, I, I think when it comes to investigating these cases and, you know, TBI makes the arrests, they, they bring some of these individuals when they rescue the victims from the scene, maybe to our kids, as you said, you work with them. And I know you can't talk about any specific cases, but in general, when you get some of these youngsters, let's say, you know, 15, 16 or younger, and they come to you, um, again, in general terms, what are the issues they deal with um, and how do you handle them and, and how do you um, help get information from them that can maybe assist in the ongoing investigation by law enforcement? I think a couple of things to be aware of is whenever children come to us, um, it's difficult for them to provide information, particularly those teenage you mentioned, you know, 14, 15 year old kids. Um, they're often afraid. Um, they may or may not be um, accompanied by a family member. Um, and so there's a lot going on for them and they're, they're reluctant to, to provide accurate information just simply out of fear. 
Um, so our primary concern is to assess for their health care. And in doing that, kids, even 14 and 15 year old kids, have an awareness that their health may be in, at risk or, or, or at least um, they may already be experiencing symptoms or issues that are, are worrisome. And so they are um, compelled or there, there is an inclination to share information with us that maybe uh, they've been too fearful to share before just so that we can take care of their health. Uh, there may be medications that children need uh, or other types of testing for infection and disease. Uh, so we will collect that information um, in an effort to make sure that they are, are healthy and that they get the care they need. We're also required in most cases by law to share that information with investigative authorities, uh, which could be the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation or local law enforcement uh, and or the Department of Children's Services. Uh, the law specifically states that any healthcare provider uh, who's evaluating a child where there are concerns of abuse, we're obligated to, uh, to share that information back with law enforcement. When, when it involves human trafficking, and I know some of these cases, you know, aren't necessarily human trafficking. They can be cases within families and the like. But if it's human trafficking and the family members are involved, I'm just curious, how, how do some of these youngsters end up with these individuals that then start selling them for sex? And, and where are the parents in this case and how are they reunited? I'm just curious, some of the cases perhaps you've seen. You know, when you think about commercial sexual exploitation of children, which is one form of human trafficking there are a wide range of possibilities in terms of how those children could come to us there are times when those cases may well involve a family member who is uh, actively um, involved in in um, putting that child in a situation where they're um, they're being exchanged for something of value, whether that's sex or, or I'm sorry, whether that's drugs or money. Um, other times, um, you may have kids that um, have somehow ended up in a situation that they didn't intend. For example, one of the concerns and one of the things that we have seen is the, the increase in kids' online activity, where they're mm -hmm. interacting with people online that they believe to be one, you know, someone they 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 don't know who they're interacting with. You know, someone has presented themselves as a either another teenager or someone who cares about them. And the more involved they begin, they begin to be with that person. Um, they soon find out that that's not who they're dealing with at all. And so, you know, they end up in situations that they never anticipated. And I think when we're thinking about things to to really share with parents hmm. is to be aware of that online activity uh, I mean all kids have electronic devices now and you have to understand uh, that when you hand a child an electronic device you are handing them I mean I, I keep repeating this you are literally handing them uh, or handing every sex offender every human trafficker in the world 24-hour access to your child and think about that <laughs> yeah i mean that's what you're handing them and and kids are smart you know they're a step ahead of us in terms of those um, social media apps all the things that you can do electronically um, ways they can communicate with their friends and again most kids get on these apps and they think they're communicating with other kids they don't realize the adults are on those sites essentially just to look for them and just to exploit them and that's the only reason that adults are on some of these sites is to find those kids who are highly vulnerable um, and who don't appreciate the the dangerous setting in which they uh, are sharing highly personal information and even agreeing to meet uh, yeah. is just not uncommon at all and and by the way i just a lot of people maybe are thinking in their own minds what kind of background these youngsters may come from but would you say it's fair that it's 
all demographic. I, you know, I think some maybe think, well, this maybe is a, a child coming from a broken home or has a lot of stress or perhaps maybe they're lower income, so they're drawn to maybe some money that's promised them or things like this. But is it fair to say that we see across the board some of these youngsters falling for this, maybe coming from, you know, um, affluent homes um, that are in school and then all of a sudden disappear? Is, is, is it fair to say that or is there a, a more specific demographic that's susceptible? I think it's really, it is so complicated. And, you know, we see in, in movies and other, you know, um, media, you know, what we think or, or how human trafficking is um, is presented in, in the sense of, a you know, someone kidnapped and held against their will and, and all those kinds of things. That's really quite rare. Uh -huh. It is very complicated. The, the ones most at risk for human trafficking by far are children with a history of child sexual abuse at a young age. Okay. Um, there's no question that kids who have been victimized early on or, or at some point in their life are more at risk for becoming victims of, of some sort of sexual exploitation later in life. Also, kids who have exposures, significant exposure to pornography, um, those kids are at a higher risk. It's, it's certainly safe to say that kids with um, other adverse experiences are at a higher risk. Having said that, those kids come from all demographics, whether it's um, you know poverty, middle class, upper class, suburban, rural, they, they come from all of those those different uh, social demographic, um, you know, or socioeconomic um, classes. There's no, you know, sexual abuse and sexual exploitation uh, affects uh, affects all all populations, uh, regardless of race, gender, class, uh, et cetera. Gotcha. Listen, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to maybe have you share with us some uh, good red flags. I did this with the special agent a moment ago, just on what uh, individuals can do to look for and then how to go about uh, reporting it. Uh, we'll have that when we come back right after this. Stay with us.